My name is Neil Urig. I'm with uh, the Post Falls Police Department. I'm going to go around and kind of introduce you to who you're going to be hearing from today. Um, first, um, I do cyber crimes for the Post Falls PD, do digital forensics. So my role is kind of taking the evidence that we take from bad guys, going through there, looking for anything that we can use to advance a case, whether that be internet history or pictures that they've taken, GPS type stuff. We also have Lonnie. You want to introduce yourself, Lonnie? cafeteria and then it's at the, uh, the, the south side of the cafeteria we are recording this presentation and so that's so that way parents that couldn't make it tonight or because of COVID uh, they would rather do it online so here's how we're going to do questions usually we just let you throw questions up as we go we're going to ask you to do the questions at the end so that way we can edit out anything that might be private that we don't want people to to hear on the internet because there are some types of questions that are a little bit more personal so uh, if you ask it during the middle, we'll still answer it, but just so you know, it'll still be on that recording. Uh, in here today, we have our school resource officer staff. I wanted to introduce them really quick. So as we talk about these issues, you know who to go and talk to in your individual schools. So first, I've got Cody Deuce. Cody is assigned to Post Falls Middle School. So that's your, uh, the, your sixth, seventh, and eighth graders there at Post Falls. Where is Annette? Annette Clark, you wanna stand up? Oh, you are standing? <laughs> She's short. Annette is assigned to River City Middle School. Then you've got J.D. Putnam. He's our elementary school uh, resource officer. And then Jeremy McMillan. He's assigned here right at Post Falls High School. So as we talk about these issues, if there's an issue going on in your, your kid's life or just something you want to know about, these are guys, great resources for you to feel free to reach out to. They're very friendly. So we'll get started. If you want to kick this off, I'll uh, get the push button thing. So this is our contact information. We'll have it available at the end as well. You want to talk about what yeah, you do with uh, iPad? Like on cell phone or digital. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a state task force, just like a lot of uh, states do. We investigate. Uh, Anybody that operates on the internet, we call them electronic service providers. Your Facebooks, Snapchat, Google, you name it. Anybody that's on there, if they, they see child exploitation or child pornography, they have to send it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They're kind of our clearinghouse for that kind of stuff. People think of missing kids when you, you think of the National Center. But really, they have a large portion to help us out. So they put a report together, and they send it to us, and we do uh, the investigations on those. Or we can pass it off to uh, one of the police departments and let them do it. Or if a department um, needs some assistance with technology, we can also uh, assist with that. We have a forensic lab. Um, Neil is the only guy here that does forensic stuff, but uh, our ICAC task force, our main office is in Boise, and we have five forensic uh, investigators now. We have three polygraph guys. We have a super big van, we call it the BAT, that we bring out to houses to preview property, like uh, tablets, phones, stuff like that. So 
that's kind of what we do in a, in a nutshell. Uh, we also do child pornography investigations. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sharing that goes on. There's legitimate uses, but there's also some nefarious uses too, and so we can track that. So uh, with, with our stats here, so everything that comes to um, Paul in particular and then to Neil, it gets reported uh, to the National Crimes Against, or excuse me, NICMIC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So that's the clearinghouse. So when they get a report, it gets sent out to local law enforcement agencies and local ICAC agencies to um, investigate those. And so you can look at this graph right here. So in the last year, so our reports were up 28% from 2019 to 2020. So that is, you know, over the COVID reporting period, um, we saw a skyrocket in just the amount of child porn online, um, things that are uh, being distributed online, um, kind of what Paul just talked about, any of those tips that come through. So it's on the rise, it's way up right now. Um, we have a prosecutor in the audience tonight that she also said, I mean, her caseload is just exploding. Um, my caseload on a daily basis, we see, you know, things coming through social media, texting, all of that. So um, it's concerning and it's on the rise. And I thank all of you parents for being here tonight. Um, that just it shows a lot, you know, that you're willing to invest in your children and you kind of understand what we're facing as parents right now. I have a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. And so because of the work I do, um, I'm just on high alert with that. And so um, I just thank you for coming, and it's really important just to get the word out. Okay. So um, this is the 2019 Idaho Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is given to high school students every two years in the state of Idaho. And I just pulled some statistics off of um, the database that shows kind of a correlation um, between social media use and how it's affecting our children. Um, the highest one is 48% um, texting or emailing while driving a car in the last 30 days. So I have a son that's going through driver's ed right now and that's super scary to think of. Our teens, you know, they're inexperienced drivers and then you give them a phone and now they're texting and driving um, or they're Snapchatting and driving. They're trying to see how fast they can go and then, you know, taking pictures and sending it to their friends. Um, and then 16% electronically bullied. Uh, we'll talk more about bullying later, but as you know, bullying doesn't stop at school like it used to. Um, in younger generations, it follows them home with their devices and on social media, so that's a big problem. 18% uh, um, that have posted or shared or revealing our sexual photo of themselves in the past 30 days. 38% um, who felt sad or hopeless. 21% who consider attempting suicide. The reason that those are in there is we're seeing a huge, huge spike in suicide and self-harm um, with our children, especially when it comes to just mental health across the board with our kids. Um, and so I, I, I really feel like a big part of that, this is due to social media. They're not getting that eye-to-eye, um, -eye, face to interaction with their peers. Um, some of them are being bullied. Um, they're seeing things online that no child should ever have to see. Um, and their innocence is kind of being taken at a younger age, and it really impacts them mentally and emotionally. Um, and then I think the bottom one there. Oh, so this one, I feel like this stat is pretty low, and it's only coming in at 25% saying um, these kids are admitting that they play computer games or um, video games for three or more hours a day. Um, I think this question could probably be phrased better when it's given to the students. Um, instead of that, they should be asking screen time, or how much time on your iPhone, how much time on your tablet. Because when they think of a computer, they think of, okay, I'm sitting down you know, at a PC or, or a laptop. So I think if this question was phrased differently, you'd see a different stat here. Um, also, if you guys do have kids with social media, or excuse me, any smart device, Go and you can look at their screen time, exactly how many hours a day they're using their phone, or a weekly average, and it will break it up um, by application, so you know exactly what apps they're using um, and how long they're using them for. So, um, so this is really interesting. Um, this is put out by Dr. Jean Twen. She has a book called iGen. It was put out in 2017, and she just went through some of the data and how um, social media and devices are affecting our children. Um, so this one, if you can see, so back in, I believe it was 2007, 
was when the, uh, excuse me, having some feedback there, was when the uh, first iPhone was released, and then in 2012 is when most adolescents um, had a phone, or it was more marketable to youth. So you can see um, kiddos aren't hanging out with their friends as much. It totally plummets, um, which is interesting because we call it social media, right? But it becomes antisocial because they're on their devices in their rooms. They're not out. They're not riding their bikes. They're not hanging out at the football game. They're literally just on their phones and their devices. Thank you. Um, more likely to feel lonely, which again, you can see it spikes around 2012. Um, and I think some of this is kind of the FOMO, the fear of missing out. Kids see their friends maybe on social media posting that they were at a party or they were hanging out and this child wasn't invited for some reason. So then they feel left out, they feel lonely, and they become more isolated, unfortunately. Um, less likely to get enough sleep. Um, kids are taking their devices into their room at night. So a big tip that we like to give parents is have a rule in your house that the phone goes up on the counter at night, it plugs in, you know it's there. Kids are up at all hours, they leave their notification settings on. So just as they're starting to doze off, it pings and they just, they have to look at it. And so they're, just, they're not getting the sleep, um, the full sleep like they should be. Um, and then less dating. Um, again, dating kind of declined too because everything's just online, you know, um, that's how they, you know, find their relationships or hook up or whatever, it's just all online. So um, a lot of the face-to-face -face interaction that I used to have as a kid, um, a lot of our kids aren't having that and it's really decreased. Okay, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the devices we're seeing with juveniles, how they're accessing the internet. Obviously, the, the common one that we're seeing with kids is phones, but there's a lot of different ways that they can get access that we've encountered that they can get around some of the parental things that we put into place. So obviously, there's so many things that, that have internet access, but we're living in a world now where it's called Internet of Things. The internet, of, uh, internet of Things, IOT, are devices like Alexa. You didn't hear me. She's not in here. <laughs> Surrey, you've got that. You've got fridges now that do that, which is really odd. My uh, slow cooker at home, I can turn it on from my phone. So all these different things potentially have the ability to access the internet. Now, obviously, I don't think they're going to text from the slow cooker. That would be a really cool device. But there's so many different ways that these kids are able to get on, and they can get around all these different parental things that they can put in place. Um, Obviously, you go to some of these public Wi-Fi points. Schools are a big one. You're here, there's Wi-Fi in this building. Schools do a lot to try to protect our kids. They put filters in place, so if you were to type in the word porn, it stops you. We had a case last year in Post Falls School District that the kid was able to get around the filter because he learned Spanish to search for porn. So on his phone, he's typing in stuff in Spanish. Well, the filter wasn't set up for that, and they were able to access it. So these, our kids are smart. Now, I give him credit. I mean, he's learning a foreign language, just not for the reasons most of us do it. Popular apps that we're seeing, and this changes every six months. And I think I'll have Paul actually talk a little bit about the apps that he's seen. But the big ones that, that we are encountering in law enforcement, Snapchat is, is very popular. TikTok, Instagram, Messenger, which is a Facebook product, Discord. Discord is more for gamers, so there's a lot of different discussion boards on there, so you're going to have them talking about different, different games, and there's a lot of exploitation that happens on that app. Uh, Pinterest. Uh, Paul, you have cases with Pinterest, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about some of these apps? Yeah, yeah. So just like Neil said, we have all these different apps, they change all the time. You know, like I was explaining to you guys, all these folks are required to report to us and say, hey, we have an adult grooming a kid, we have um, maybe a kid sending an inappropriate picture to another person, or, you know, the list is long on that. But you gotta look at, uh, Snapchat's really good, Instagram is Facebook, and Facebook does a great job of reporting. And if you can only imagine uh, how big Facebook is now. So it's through the world, and they're trying to combat uh, you know, sexual exploitation on their platform, which is really, really tough. 
So, and it's inundated law enforcement throughout the United States because they, now they have this federal requirement. Um, but we can also put up Amazon up here. So we just recently found that people have found ways to get around the shopping part of that. They use it like a search engine. So, you know, they, they do a great job too. And they do all the reporting. But how many people are on Amazon? Anybody have a guess? I don't know. I'm, I really don't know, but an awful lot. So with all these, uh, they all have their, their problems as far as uh, law enforcement goes. So a lot of the data, obviously, with Snapchat is gone. So that hurts us when it comes to investigations. So it goes from Facebook, just to use an example, to the National Center, to our ICAC commander, then to me. So we're already behind, super behind. So there, you can put anything up there, and our kids are finding a way uh, to use it. So you know what's? I don't know if you guys have ever Googled uh, newest apps, but do it one day, see what they have. And then maybe six months later or four months later, go back and do it again. And you'll see apps that you've never seen before. And even with my job, the, all the things that we look at, I still have to Google and you know look up that company and what they do. So we have Kick. You guys know what Kick is? The messaging apps, WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp. So a lot of our kids are using that. Not your head. And Telegram. Yeah, so all these messaging apps, a lot of people will meet, kids and kids, kids and adults. They'll be on a certain app, then they go to texting each other, or they'll go to a messaging app. Some are encrypted, some are not. So. Anybody still use MySpace? <laughs> just you, just you. Um, so just know as parents, um, most apps you have to be 13 years or older to have any sort of app social media. Um, a lot of kids, they don't care about that. They're gonna go on at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. It's real easy to bypass all of that. These apps aren't screening kids at all. So you just hit, are you over 13 yet? And then you're, you're in, you have the app. So as a parent, that's your job to make sure what, what is your kid downloading um, from the app store. Um, some of these, just as an example, Snapchat, a lot of you guys know about Snapchat. It goes away instantly once you open it. Um, we'll talk. Facebook, yeah. Facebook yes. Too. Yep. So. And a lot of them they have incognito modes, and so it's there's just so much. I mean, it's a bottomless pit of information. It can seem overwhelming. But like Paul said, if you're uh, if you're googling it, you'll know it. I mean, everything's on there. So just search it up and figure it out as a parent. Um, as a probation officer, um, a lot of times I have a search clause where I can search juveniles' phones at any time, and you would be you would be appalled at what is on a lot of these phones. Um, I just had a girl recently, um, she bought a second round of cocaine through Snapchat, through a dealer, a club that she had on Snapchat and delivered it, got it delivered to a hotel room. Um, a lot of, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of young people um, selling videos of themselves online. Um, Only fans is one of the sites that they can do that on. Um, people will pay, uh, basically, to watch their videos or have access to those videos. Um, so if you see that on your kid's phone, why is it on there? Maybe have that conversation. Um, dating apps, if you want to come to the next one there. So. There we go. So um, this one I just pulled off the other day because I was trying to update our slides because like Paul said, they're always changing. Um, and so these are the top ones. The overall downloads are on the left. Um, and then this is, I think this was worldwide actually. Um, so you have some weird ones down at the bottom, like a Japanese app there. Um, but all those pretty much you guys are probably familiar with. TikTok's really popular. Um, a couple that I had to look up was the Likey. I think that's kind of new, but that's a video sharing. It's another video one. It's a live stream app. So kids can get on there and just live stream themselves doing whatever. Um, so it's kind of a playground for predators, right? Because they're logging in. They're going where the kids are going to go. The predators are going to go to the gaming apps. They're going to go to where the teeny boppers are going to go and um, do videos. So just be aware of that. 
So kind of along that line um, about back to the accident and social media, um, the kiddos uh, that, a lot of the kids that I come into contact with, um, as far, far as their friends and their followers, some of these kids have 600, 700, 800, 1,000 friends. And I always have that conversation with them like, oh, do you know all these people in real life? Well, of course they don't. And so I always ask them, well, what, how do you decide who you accept as a friend or a follower? Because you're basically inviting them into your private life. And they say, oh, well, you know, if, if they look safe, because, you know, a picture's going to be super legit, a predator's going to use their legit real picture. Um, you know, or they say, well, it's a friend of a friend. So because they're friends with my other friend, that's, you know, it, they, they're safe, it's fine, whatever. Um, so something I always tell the kiddos is that, you know, for one, you don't know who the person is, but at probation, we have, um, we have a couple of accounts just kind of on the down low, and we friend some of our clients and some of our clients' friends, and we have about five or 600 friends right now, and we're not even a real person. Like, this is just a fictitious person that we made up, but we have like 600 friends. And so that just goes to show you these kids aren't vetting who is following them, who they're friends with, they have no idea. And so just educating the kids about, hey, if you don't know this person in real life, you don't know them. You know, you don't have any solid foundation of who this person is. And so we talk a lot about that. Um, this next one, sexting. So this goes over um, some of the stats. So sexting, you guys, I'm sure you all know what that is, but sending, um, you know, a new picture or something like that, either through texting or messaging, um, posting pictures. Uh, right now, it looks like, so the green is kids that have received uh, one of these photos, and then the blue is they're sending these photos. And so more kids are receiving them than sending them. Um, girls always, not always, but even the girls are getting pictures from males. They're getting penis pics, which nobody wants to see that. Um, but they're just, they're doing it. And so in their world, this is, this is normal to them now, unfortunately. A lot of these kids just, they, they don't, it, it's not different for them. It's different for us because we didn't grow up in this online world. Um, I didn't. And so for them, it's just accepted now, unfortunately. It's a reality. They've been desensitized. Our children are all being desensitized, and it's unfortunate. You can see it through the media. You can see it online. It's um, not our at-risk kids. It's our good students. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it time and time again where we've had these 4.0 students, really good kids, that are making really bad decisions. So. Right. So um, what I always... When I go to schools, Paul and I go into the high schools and we go into um, the middle schools. But when I'm talking to the high school students, I like to bring up the fact that I'm old and I did not have a smartphone when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. Um, I think I had like a flip phone and that was it. So what I tell them is teenagers are impulsive. We know that their brains are still developing. Um, but now they have this, this device at their fingertips and it's just instant gratification. Everything's instant. And so they're sending these sexting or sexting without even thinking about it. It's just like click, send, done. They're not putting any forethought into it. Some of them might regret it. Some of them probably don't care and they move on. Um, but I like to create the analogy of if I were to do that back in the 90s, <laughs> I would have to get either a Polaroid camera or just an old school camera and take a picture of myself, really awkward picture, take it to Rite Aid, get it developed by some creeper in the dark room, right? <laughs> maybe ask for like 100 photos so I can pass them out of school because that sounds like a great idea. So I'd have to do that. I'd go back. I'd get them at writing because it wasn't the hour development, developing because I couldn't afford that. It was like the five days later I get them. Half the pictures really suck. There's like two good ones. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to pass these out to all my friends in the hallway. About 100 kids, I'm going to share this new photograph of myself in the hallway. And they're just... They are just mortified. They're like, what? You, no, there's no way. No way. You can't do that. You'd never do that. Are you kidding me? And I'm like, well, you guys, your photos just went up to hundreds, if not thousands of people with one click. So what's the difference? And then it kind of dawns on them like, oh, you know what? You're right. And you can't get those photos back online. You cannot get them back. So once they're out there, they're out there. And unfortunately, these kiddos are sending them. And then the ones that do regret it, or maybe they're bullied later on down the road, or maybe, you know, they get a job five years later and things are popping up. Or they apply to a college and somebody uses it to blackmail them. And so we just have these really hard conversations with them and just to let it sink in. Um, to really think about their actions. Because it, 
any one point as a high school student in the 90s, I could have stopped myself at Rite Aid or when I was driving to school or something and said, okay, this is a bad idea. My brain could kick in. But they're so impulsive and it's so quick with devices that it just, they don't give it a second thought. So just talking to our kids about that. So we'll tell you a little bit about how the laws work on the, these topics. So unfortunately, we're living in a world where a lot of this conduct is criminalized. And obviously when we think about child pornography, we're thinking about those creepy guys in mom's basements sitting there with Cheetos and they're on the computer all day. The law is the exact same for kids though. And so when they're sharing these images, and especially if they use it to exploit someone or blackmail someone, these are felony sex crimes. These are the ones that get you registered as a sex offender, that affect the ability to get jobs, scholarships, you can't get the military, it's, it's just bad news. There's a lot of different categories that it falls into. Everything from creation to distribution, these are federal crimes as well, and so they have mandatory fines that come with it, you have restitution costs, so if we know who the victim is in the case, you have to pay the victim money, which, depending on the situation, I think is absolutely accurate, but uh, or appropriate, but some of these cases where it's kids sending photos to other kids, uh, a little bit harsh, but it is the reality of the world we're living in. Juvenile offenders, thankfully, we do have a juvenile system that is built to rehabilitate a lot of these kids. So if we charge them with these type of crimes, at least we do have some probation officers that are very good at what they do, and can hopefully sometimes they, the crimes will get dismissed after it's dealt with. But basically, if a kid has nude photos on their phone and they're underage, it's a crime. They can't have it, they can't share it, it's illegal. Uh, so, I don't know where you're going with that. <laughs> so when we talk about this, you automatically think about that sex offender driving that white van around, picking up kids. That's not our offenders in this. So in my almost 10 years of doing this, we've only had two sex offenders that we have caught. What we're seeing uh, with the child pornography and the grooming, which we'll get to next, is these are white males. They're educated. They have a family, typically married, and that's our offender. It's not the sex offenders that you look up on the computer and you get your sex offender for this. You see all these people on there, guys and girls alike, by the way. So just remember, it's the person that you're shopping with, um, people that uh, you see at sporting events, you know, other parents. So and it happens every time. We'll go do a search warrant at a house and we'll, you know, raise a ruckus in the neighborhood. And the next day, I'll get a call from somebody and we'll say, hey, are my kids okay? We were friends with that family. So just remember that it's not the sex offenders that are always doing this. Okay, so we're going to talk about sex trafficking and how that is developing in our world right now. So sex trafficking used to be uh, the street corner type activity that you've always heard about. I can think back just 10 years ago driving down Spray in Spokane, you would see prostitutes um, it's shifted now. Everything's online. And they're getting their victims through different methods on social media. Whether it be trying to get girls to run away from home, or they're trying to offer them a job. And then once they get them into their custody, so they convince them to come to them, they put them to work. They make them become prostitutes and then they travel them around the country. And we've had a couple cases, at least here in Post Falls, where that has happened and it takes months and months to try to find these girls. And typically, by the time we find them, they've been uh, violated by hundreds and hundreds of uh, males, because it's typically our, our perpetrator, as Paul was saying, and we have to try to find them all over the country. The grooming that's involved is, is going online and trying to get the kids to feel more comfortable with the idea of sex, the idea of adult companionship, and they're targeting specific juveniles. They're, in my experience, looking at single parent households. So it's, that's the, the households where mom is working as hard as she can, but there's nobody else to help with that kiddo. 
And so that kid kind of can do what they want. A lot of times it's low income, so they're trying to find support to that kid so that the groomer, and I've seen this in all, almost all of my grooming cases, they buy the juvenile female a cell phone because mom can't afford it and they really wanted that cell phone and even the parents sometimes find out, like, well, it seems like it's okay, it seems legit, I'll let him buy that phone and he keeps paying for it. And that's a big power tool over, over that, that victim and eventually they're able to communicate with them just privately on the device that they pay for. And eventually as they get closer to, to uh, this juvenile, they will start doing physical grooming or just slight touching where they'll touch them on the leg until they get comfortable with that physical contact to the point where they can exploit it. According to Nick, Nick about one out of every five girls and one out of ten boys will be abused uh, before they come of age. And they will be solicited online. And it's happening specifically to underage girls. So I have an underage account that I pretend to be a 14-year-old girl on Facebook. I got lots of friends. I'm pretty cool. I was cool in school, too. But I'm constantly getting inundated with males trying to be my friend. Just starting with the word, hey, you want to talk? You look cute. Oh, so pretty. And they're trying to groom me. This is happening to every girl online. It's happening to me, and I've talked to lots of different underage girls in our school system, and it's happening to them as well. So you have to be very cautious. If your kids are on social media, there are people trying to groom them today. Sextortion. You want to do this one? I think this is the, like, my case, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll talk about this one. So sextortion is the use of black veil to get new photographs or even go to the point of actually having sex with the victim. And this is very common both with juveniles and adults. I get a lot of adult men that get actually extorted for money through sex extortion. Let's, hopefully, I don't know if this will play it. Yeah, I think we're going to push the button. Technology and makes our life easier. Okay, let's hope this works. Hi, Zach. Here's another video from our special guy. We haven't talked all day. I wish you went to my school or went closer so we could finally meet. Take it up. In an hour. Don't spend too long on the phone. Okay. I know you've been waiting for this for a while. I wanted to give you something special.
Why are you doing this?
screenshot it if possible, don't reply, delete the account, report the activity, and then just take a break. Have your kiddo take a break. Um, it's not worth their mental health. Really, it's not. Okay, so pornography itself is legal, right? So there's uh, all these legal sites that kids are able to access. It's legal for adults, but it is illegal for juveniles to possess adult pornography. Pornography, unfortunately, is becoming very normal for our kids. I do all the cell phone forensic exams for post walls and pretty much, I think, all the calls pretty much as well. When I have a kid's phone, I 100% of the time find adult pornography on there. It's becoming normalized, even on the female's phones. So this is becoming normal behavior. So we need to be watching for this. You'll see these stats here that a vast majority of boys acknowledge seeing online pornography. Girls, a majority as well. We're seeing a lot of teens now that have unreal expectations of what relationships are and what sex looks like. So when I was a kid, uh, I remember seeing my first pornography magazine. It was at the gas station and I had to like work for it. Like I was sneaking, like hoping the teller doesn't see me. I looked at it, oh my gosh, that's awesome. It's not that hard for our kids now. And so they're now learning that these type of behaviors are appropriate. And so we're seeing, at least in the uh, sex cases that we encounter where kids are victimized, we're seeing sex that's much more violent and uh, sex acts that uh, definitely were not normal when I was a kid. So, we told you all this scary stuff. What do we do now? How, what are the best ways to protect our kids to take steps? Because obviously, it's not realistic to say they can't have cell phones. Kids need to be able to communicate. It's not realistic to say don't go on the internet. They need to be able to research for school and all the other stuff that we do on the internet. So here's some different steps that you can go to, go through. If your child is under 13, help enforce the rule of them not using social media. It's almost universal that all these apps do not allow juveniles under the age of 13 to use their, pro their, their, uh, their application. Set accounts to private. Now this has to be ongoing. Facebook is notorious for updating their security settings and it resets so you're a public profile. So you have to go on there monthly just to make sure everything is set to private. Turn off GPS features on the device. So some of these applications track your location and share it with other people. So what I do on my phone is I just turn off the GPS until I need to use it. So most of the time you're not going to need it, but if you leave it on, these apps are going to be uh, saving that data and sharing it with other users. Limit the friends to less than 200. So I think you kind of touched on it. These are, you want your kids to actually have a face-to-face -face interaction with these people. They actually know them. Not everyone that sends them a message do they friend, because that's how they get themselves in trouble. Teach them only the ones that they know. Having mutual friends is not good enough. We see a lot of that where they're saying, well, they're friends with my friends. Well, then you talk to that person, you find out, well, he's friends with that person, and nobody actually knows that person. And so their justification of their friends with so-and-so doesn't jive. Review and verify all the social media contacts. Never share personal information online. This is really important for school-age kids. So you're an athlete. You take a picture of you running track. You're in your school uniform. What does that tell a perpetrator? They know what school you go to. They know what type of activity you like to do. So now they figured out how to find you just by driving to your school and say, okay, he runs track. I'll park my car by the track and wait for them to come out. So we try to, if you're posting photos online, you send them to private, and no information, like on your clothing, you don't want to have addresses in the background, you want to make it so they can't figure out who you are. Consider things like a gadget watch or a gab phone. These are just devices that basically you can control. Now there's a lot of different applications out there that you can purchase to be able to monitor your juvenile's devices. So the one I use for my kid is called Bark. 
like Dog Bark, B A R K. It does cost $8.99 a month, but this application will send you every message they send. It'll send me an alert if they're looking at things that they're not supposed to. So it's a pretty good application. There are some free ones out there, but obviously you get what you pay for. Uh, Verizon has some parental features that you can use, so look around, look at the reviews when you look at these, but uh, Bark is one that I'll recommend because I've used it and it works pretty good for my kiddo. Yeah. So the bottom two were, um, consider delaying the age in which you gave your child a smartphone. So a lot of parents always tell me like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have waited. I wish I wouldn't have given um, a smartphone to my middle schooler, my fifth grader, my sixth grader, my seventh grader. So um, consider delaying that. And I understand parents want to communicate with their children. Um, I went through this with my um, oldest child, now he's 14, um, but he got a phone, well at first it was a flip phone because that's all they had. But now there's um, a product on the market. It's the only one I found so far. It's called Gab Wireless. The phone's $100, usually they have deals like $30 off, so 70 bucks, it's 20 bucks a month, um, super affordable, it does not have any Wi-Fi capability, so it's just uh, talking, texting, and then there's a few apps on there like an alarm clock, a calculator, things like that, but there's no way that they can um, download any apps on there, there's no way they can have games on there, any social media on there, it's literally just a communication device, um, and the plan we have, you can, his phone can take pictures, but it cannot send pictures, it cannot send or receive pictures. It can do emojis through texting, but that's it. And he's 14, so I wanted to get him at least through middle school, which I feel like are the hardest years for our kids, before I felt like he was even mature enough to have a smartphone. He still doesn't have a smartphone. He has an iPod that stays at home, and it's got a custodial app on it, and it's usually on lockdown because he didn't do his homework, so. <laughs> um, that's my son. Um, so anyways, the Gab device, the Gizmo Gadget Watch is great for younger kids and up. I have the older model because um, it's went through a couple kids now. Um, but that one's great because let kids be kids. It's, it's a watch. Um, you can plug in um, pre-programmed text messages um, such as yes, no, uh, do you want me to call you, I'm checking in, or something like that. And then it can call and text up to 10 people that you put in as the parent onto their watch. So that's what my 11-year-old has. And it's, it's great because he doesn't need to have a smart device. There's absolutely no way. My boys are gamers. They like to game. And I just know that's all they would do 24-7 if they had a device, let alone a device at school, which is a huge problem, too. Um, I can't see this either. OK, so just get educated on social media. That's what you guys are doing tonight. Ignorance is not an excuse to neglect your child, child's safety. So just be invested in your child because as parents, we not only have to parent in the real world and what we see every day, we have to parent in the digital world and it's much different now. Um, so just make sure you're educated and just every so often try to Google something or just try to learn something weekly. Ask your kid what they're using um, if you don't know. Talk to them, have an open discussion. Um, there's some great things uh, that I found and I think we're gonna hit on it, but there's an app called Smart Social that you can download and basically it's a plethora of, inf of information for parents you can um, put in different apps and it will tell you exactly what that app does, what their rating of that is uh, for children. Um, it comes up with blog posts, reviews, articles, smart social. You can download it on your phone. Um, there's a great documentary if you guys have time. It's called Childhood 2.0. It's amazing. It was just made within the last year, so it's really up to date. And they actually interview two different groups of kids. And then they interview kids um, individually as well as parents. Um, and it gives you a really good look at how kids view social media and technology and how their parents do and how do you kind of marry the two and so that we can live in this world together, right? Because um, they don't know a world without social media, without devices. They think we're super old and don't know what we're talking about, which that's true some of the time, but uh, we're trying to learn as we go. Um, random device checks, phone checks. So I'm the old school. If you, you're the parent, that is your device. It is not their device. They do not get to hold all the passwords to it. You get the passwords, you know where that device is. If, if you need to take it away, you take it away. That's just, you as a parent, you need to take your power back. And I think, unfortunately, I have parents call my office all the time. Well, they won't give me their phone. They won't give me their passcode. Well, take it, figure it out, do something. You know, they just can't free roam. You gotta parent your children. So just empowering parents that way is, is huge. Um, so this is a big one that I do with my son with his iPod. So don't give your kid the app download password. 
So um, a lot of them are like thumbprints now, but you can still do it to where you have to enter a password to download the apps either on the iPhone or the Apple or the Google Play Store. And so for him, if he wants an app, he has to come and he has to ask me. And we have a conversation. I say, okay, well, why do you want this app? Well, because so and so and we're playing this game and you know we want the computer or whatever. Okay. So now not only do I know what that app's about, I know it's on his phone. I know it's there. Um, and so if I didn't know it was there, I wouldn't know what to look for, and I'd have no idea I'd be clueless. Um, so that really helps have your kid turn in devices at night. We already talked about that. Um, and then you can restrict things with your contract carrier. So if you don't want to get a third-party app um, for parental controls, you can use Verizon, uh, friendly sharing. Uh, I have a Verizon phone, so I'm most familiar with that. I purchased a third-party app called Custodio, and that's pretty good because it goes over all platforms. So Galaxy, Samsung, iPhone, and I can control it from my phone. Um, and it's been pretty good sometimes. There's some glitches, but the cool thing is, is um, after their set amount of time, it just shuts down and they can't play it anymore. Um, it shows me exactly where they were online, what apps they were on. It will give me an alert um, if there was something questionable. I can click on it and see exactly what they were trying to look up or find or play, um, which is really helpful. Um, Neil talked about Bark, so that's another great one. Um, Team Save, Life360, there's, there's just a ton of them out there for you guys to do your research on these. Um, please respect and abide by the cell phone policies instituted at your child's school. Um, so this is becoming a problem on the bus and in the schools and in the classrooms and in the hallways. So um, what we're seeing now is even kids that don't have phones, they're exposed to everything else because everyone else has a phone and they have them at school and you know their buddy's like, oh my gosh, look at this. And these poor parents that don't want their child exposed to that are just they're already exposed, you know, at school. So um, you know, if you need to get a hold of your child, there's always other ways, right? You can call the school, you can call the office. Um, you know, just the amount of distraction that phones give kids, especially when they're trying to learn at school. Um, they have so much time on their screens as it is. To have the screens at school is a distraction. And in my opinion, working the job I work and seeing how hard our educators work to be with these kids and educate these kids, a lot of the time is spent dealing with the online drama that these phones create in schools. And it's really sad because they're there to get an education and to have a healthy social life face to face with their friends. But instead, they're in the hallways or they're at lunch or whatever with their faces glued to their phones or making videos in the cafeteria instead of having like real genuine relationship with people around them. Um, so anyways, just support your schools the best you can with that. They're doing their best and they're tired and they're parents too and they get it, it's hard, but just try to respect those policies. Um, and just set a good example for your kid. If they see you on your phone all the time and you tell them, hey, get off your phone, and then you're on there scrolling, I think we're all guilty of this, you know, checking email or paying bills online or whatever, that's not always my excuse, but um, just set that good example and just have that, just that healthy uh, digital family life at home. Um, internet safety contract. So if you haven't given your child a phone yet, or maybe you guys need to have a family meeting about what's going on with their devices, this is a good way to do it. You can Google um, exactly this, device contracts for kids, and it will give you great ideas about what are the rules for your child's device? What time do they need to turn it in at night? Do they get it taken away if they have Fs? Um, what do you expect of them with their behavior online? Um, so this is a great way to have that family conversation before you give them a device, or if they're struggling with the device that they already have. So um, you wouldn't just give your, your kid keys to your car, you would have a talk about what are the expectations of having that car. Same with the device. Um, these are some of the resources we just talked about. The smart social app, the Gab wireless phone, and it looks just like a regular smartphone, but it's not. Um, the Custodio app, the Bark app, so these are ones that we all use. Um, so they're, they're great resources. And that's it, so I'll let you One more thing. So you got to start the dialogue with your kids the minute you give them that device. And you've got to have this open relationship with them so they can tell you stuff. So you want to know if somebody's asking them for pictures. But we don't want you to lose it. We want you to have that poker face. And even though you're burning inside, you got to be able to have that dialogue. Because the minute you explode, guess what happens? They're going to shut down. 
So you gotta develop that dialogue, you gotta talk to them about it, talk, 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 and talk. Don't stop talking about this stuff. Um, we're just seeing this uprise in all these issues, uh, teen suicide, one of them. Um, so, you know, we've got to stop it somehow. And I think parents are afraid to talk to their kids about stuff. Ask them, hey, has anybody sent you a picture? Have you ever sent a picture? Ask that. So I know that's a tough thing. You can't just sit them down and go, hey, you ever get a picture? You've got to develop that, that dialogue well before So this will be the end of the recording, and so we're going to allow you guys now to ask some questions. But first, I want to tell you about some resources that we do have here in the back. So Panhandle Health has brought some really good resources for some of the stuff that we're seeing with juveniles outside of internet safety. Uh, obviously, we still have issues with vape pens. We still have issues with pills, alcohol, marijuana, especially now that it's legalized in Washington. It's leaking over here. And so there's some different resources back here that I invite you to come and take a look at uh, on your way out tonight. Give me an idea what we're doing tomorrow. So how many are River City Middle School parents? Okay. And then we, what about Post Falls Middle? And then are any high school parents? Okay, so we're, so we're up there. So tomorrow at River City, we're going to do an assembly for each grade level talk about these issues. Now, we're not going to say the things like pornography or penis pics with our students, okay? We're going to be age appropriate, but we are taking some of this material to them. We are going to reinforce some of this stuff that we've told you. So when we talk to the students and we say, hey, we're telling your parents to search your phone. We want to reinforce that so we're all on the same page. So the expectations that we're putting on them they know, you know, everyone's on the same page. So that's why we're trying to do this at the same time. We talk to you, tell you what we're going to talk to your kids about. Obviously, that's more appropriate for them. But we're also going to hopefully reinforce that so you're able to do your job a little bit better. Um, for Post Falls Middle School, we're trying to work out a date with Mark and I. So we're working out a date to do that there. Post Falls High School, I'm going to have a, talk, a chance to talk to Mr. Sensel. We did Post Falls High School. Um, not since COVID, it was before COVID that we were up here. So with that, we'll